Hey, everybody, Dave Hagan here. Today, we want to talk about cutting your nut. That's today on the Financial Wellness Podcast, Coronavirus Edition. Welcome to the Financial Wellness Podcast, Dave's weekly message to keep you on your path to financial success. Here is your host, financial problem solver and talk show host, Dave Hagan. Thank you, Nick, and welcome to the Financial Wellness Podcast, or TFWP, as those of us in the business like to call it. We're coming to you from four different places around the state of California today, Southern California today. And we're looking forward to talking to you about cutting your nut. But first, let's let's see who's here. Oh, oh, look, it's Brian Reed. Heidi ho, David. How are you, buddy? Pretty good. And yourself? Hanging in there, um, surviving all of the riots, and uh, looking forward to a more peaceful future. I hope. Yeah, the last week or something, they were. Uh, I mean, really, very, very close to where you live. Well, they're close to almost where everyone is living because now they're coming to all neighborhoods. <laughs> oh, my goodness. You know, I I uh, got an email from the owners of the building uh, where I have my office yesterday. And they said, we're shutting it up at 3.30 because we think, uh, uh, you know, there's mischief and mayhem coming this way. So we're just closing the building. I had no idea. I still walked out at the regular time, but who knew? Kind of crazy. I know. I know. Oh, and look at that. We're also joined by our announcer, Nick Capel. Nick, how you doing? Good, Dave. As always, great to be here. Sounds good. Sounds good. Hey, life in San Diego treating you well? Life's good. I'm officially back in the office as of this week. Nice. And I have just been waiting for this moment for quite a while. Nice, nice. So I got to ask you guys a, like a serious uh, question. What the hell's going on? <laughs> My God, we just finished, what, 90 days, 120 days of the social D to avoid the Corona V. And now we've got riots in the streets. It has, it, has the world gone mad? What's up with that? Take this one, Brian. <laughs> hey, Nick, appreciate that. Uh, that's called a punt, just so you know, everyone. Everyone wanting to be socially <laughs> uh, correct or what have Look, you. we've got some uh, some protesters who have a message that they're trying to send, and uh, they're doing it peacefully. And then you've got some bad eggs. So, uh, you know, I don't know. Maybe this is a little deeper than, you know, needs some more digging, but who knows? Well, it's kind of ironic that the the bad eggs are messing it up for the protesters who want to make an intellectual and emotional point. This is true. But now there's also all these conspiracy arguments of things being provided and who really wants what to really happen. And I like to fish. <laughs> <laughs> it's Can simpler. I and go fish. It's simpler, and, that, right? and that's called deflecting. <laughs> <laughs> you know, maybe next week we ought to uh, go out on the street and do this live out on a street right in the middle of, of all the protesting and stuff. That would be, uh, I don't think we have the insurance for it. That buddy. would be, that would be a challenge though. Wouldn't it? <laughs> that would be a challenge. We don't have the insurance for it. <laughs> I, uh, I I feel sick already. <laughs> and, and the whole yeah, Dick, thing. You're looking a little peaked there, buddy. <laughs> Maybe he's got a little Corona V work in there. I don't know. You know, all of this stuff with the, the looting and all that, it's kind of made the, all the other stuff, all the health stuff in the background. It's kind of weird. Cause here we were just coming out. I, I saw something on the, uh, uh, what was it? On one of the media sources the other day. And it said that uh, this fellow had a haircutting place. And he had been closed for like 90 days and he was open for half a day. It was the first day back and all of the stuff happened and he closed the shop back up. Boy, that's brutal. That's brutal stuff. Well, anyway, we're not going to solve that today, but I just thought it was an interesting point of reference or, or context. What I want to talk about is cutting the nut. And I know that nut is kind of a term that's, you know, maybe it's a little bit of an old term. Brian told me that, uh, you know, hey, it's, it's a little not, not so cool. It's a little, 
It's a little uh, what it's they call it. It's a little it? dated. It's but a little dated. Like, it's a little prefer- dated, but it still makes a point. So I like to think of it as classic, not dated. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to talk about huh? Potato, potato. I like it. I like it. Yeah. So I wanted to talk a little bit about cutting the nut, reducing your overhead, reducing your expenses again. You remember a couple of weeks ago, we spoke with Amanda in episode 312, I believe it was. And if you don't remember that interview, that conversation with that nice long, young lady, uh, go check it out because there were just several just gems that came out of uh, um, that interview. And I told you, she's a, a friend of my daughter. She's a millennial. She's a couple years into her career and she just recently got laid off and we were talking to her about her coronavirus plan, how she was going to be sustainable through that. And she talked about all these different things. But the one thing that really struck me, um, you guys, is that she had low overhead, abnormally low overhead, really low overhead, no car payment, low rent, a lot of things like that. And that was kind of the cornerstone of her plan. And I've been thinking about that. And, you know, I went out to the internet and I'm kind of pinking around looking for some interesting information to see what others recommend to reduce your nut or to cut your expenses. So I came across this article called uh, on the website, make it actually. And the article was called stop wasting your money on these seven things. If you want to retire early by Steve Adcock. Yeah. And um, he really talked about cutting expenses. He's pretty serious about it. And I thought, well, what is what does Steve know about cutting expenses? It's a nice article. There's a couple of interesting things I like. But here's his credentials. Uh, he's 38. He retired at 35. His wife retired at 31. Hmm. Sounds like pretty good credentials to me because I'm twice his age and uh, I'm still working. More importantly, maybe he writes for Market Watch, Forbes, Business Insider. I think he's got some really interesting perspective. And he doesn't strike me as one of the, the fire people, you know, the financial independence retire early folks that say, look, eat macaroni for, you know, macaroni and cheese for 20 years and then retire, or mac and cheese for five years and retire. He was really talking about thoughtfully reducing some of his expenses. And he and his wife were able to retire at a, at a very early age. Now, we've talked about retiring before, and I'm not sure that that's the goal. Maybe, maybe the word is financial independence. But um, I thought that he had some interesting things to say. So here are seven points that this 38-year-old retiree, if you will, thinks Americans should do to stop wasting their hard-earned cash. Number one, eating out. Now, we've talked about this, but I think there's a couple of interesting gems that that he had included in his article. He says that eating out includes delivery and drink. Now, a couple of years ago, we didn't even think about delivery so much, but that's become an important component of the expense now that we have, especially during these Corona V days, because we're having more and more uh, stuff delivered. But the drink part of it, I thought was interesting, because I've always thought that um, you know, the, the alcohol portion of the bill seems abnormally large for what you tend to get. So he was saying that in his analysis, he and his wife would spend on average about seven fifty a month for eating out. And again, that included delivery and drink. Now, seven fifty for two people, that sounds about right. In fact, maybe it even sounds a little light. What do you think, Brian? That's like three, three something a person, right? Yeah, but that depends on where you're living, the restaurants that you are attending. I'm mm-hmm. assuming that, you know, these are going to be your mom and pop places. So they're not exactly going to be the um, as cheap as uh, a big chain that right. has deeper pockets. Mm-hmm. Um, but you're also not going to Beverly Hills. True. So true. What do you think, Nick? You think you spent three and a quarter going out and bringing in? Personally, Easy. no. No, really? I don't. Um, really? I know other I know other people spend more than that or a similar amount. Right. Um, I, I love cooking. I love uh, you know, like a nice ten dollar Trader Joe's bottle of wine at home. And uh, but I can see how other people do it and I, I think it's reasonable if it's three and a quarter. 
Okay. I mean, it sounds about right to you, even though that might not be your cup of tea. Correct. Exactly. All right. All right. So Adcock says out of the 750, it's uh, $210 for meals and 189 for drinks and takeout or delivery 178 and buying lunch 173. Now we've talked about buying lunch and how to reduce that cost, et cetera, et cetera. But you know, the guys, the interesting thing that, that, that really struck me was the cost of the meal at 210 was almost the same as the drinks at 189. Seem, don't I mean we God, we spend a lot of money on alcohol. It's it's a lot, but I mean that's how most restaurants and bars make their money. They're not really making it on food; they're more making it on the drinks, and that's why liquor licenses cost so much to acquire. Yeah, yeah, but you know, when I'm on the other side of that equation, I don't care how much they make. I, I care how much I spend. You know what I mean? I mean, I I understand the rationale, and and I think you're exactly right, but. Um, golly, that, that seems like a lot, you know, I mean, if you add what, 750 up, that comes to like $9,000 a year. That's a lot of coin. That's a lot of coin. Uh, 9,000 a year is probably, uh, 14, 15,000 pre-tax. That's a lot of money. It's a lot. It's uh, definitely you know, a lot. It, it's a bunch. It's a bunch. So, you know, I was thinking about this whole thing about having a drink when you go out to dinner and I'm trying to figure out why do I do that? They say, Oh, would you like a cocktail before dinner? I always say yes. And I'm kind of trying to figure out why I say yes, because a glass of wine is 12 or 15. Well, you can buy a mighty fine bottle of wine for 12 or 15 and drink it at home. You know what I mean? I remember when I was, um, you know, a, a number of years ago, we went to a, a restaurant, they charge us $8 for a glass of Chardonnay. And my wife and I went, are you kidding me? Oh my God, $8 for a glass of wine? That's nothing. It's, it's 13, 14, 15. Now we were in, in Vegas, you order a, um, a drink, 15 bucks for a martini. It's like, and it's not Wait. even that good, frankly. Really? Where do you go? I was just in Vegas and they charge us $22 for a drink. One, well, you, you know, you, you well, live a, a little higher on the hog. Than I do. Yeah, quote unquote, wow. their selling point is that you're paying for the ambiance for the, for the location. Yeah. And, and, and like I said, Dave, you know, I don't do it when I'm at home, but when I'm out, you know, that's the time that you spend. And that's one of the reasons why I don't spend so much at home yeah. because when I, when I go out, I don't want to say how much is this? How right. much is that? I, I right. enjoy the lifestyle. Right. Was it worth 22 though? Uh, at the time, be, because it was my uh, girlfriend's anniversary and she wanted to go, of course it was oh, worth well, it. Uh, yeah, your anniversary with your girlfriend, <laughs> of course. That, that's nothing. You'll spend anything, right? Oh, the dinner was Almost. 250 bucks, but yeah. Wow. <laughs> if, you weren't a, if you weren't a dude, I'd date you. You you know how to do, <laughs> do it upright. Oh, my goodness gracious. But, you know, I, I mean, I remember when we went to Vegas and we're doing these $15 drinks and they do them out of the push button with the nozzle and stuff. And they're marginal. I mean, it's not good stuff. You know, I mean, it'd be different if someone came to the table and mixed it up and minced up your little onion or whatever they do. And, uh, but it's, 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 it's not that good, actually. I remember last time we were in Vegas, we, we got off the plane. We, we stopped at a place and got a bottle of what we thought we would drink. And we, we mixed up some, some craft cocktails in the room before we went out and had dinner. Way cheaper, way better, you know. But I'm still going back to this idea. Why do I, why do I need some alcohol before the meal? Now I get it with wine with dinner, because wine with a steak is a crazy good thing, right? Or if you're having some chicken, some white wine, it's it's crazy good. It enhances the flavor. But do you need a little sugary drink before dinner? And I'm trying to figure out why I do that. Is it is it marketing? Is it just your you've been conditioned by? I maybe so. Is it habit? Maybe. I mean, I think um, Brian actually raises a good point, but yeah. I mean, the first thing I thought of was maybe, you know, you have a drink, you catch a, a little buzz before dinner. It might make your meal taste a little better. Everyone just a little bit more relaxed possibly. Yeah, no, I, I think maybe that's, you know, that's part of it. Um, uh, you know, in fact, one of the things that I was thinking about is, yeah, do I need a buzz for dinner? But I think you're maybe taken away from the taste of the food if you're really out for a, you know, you're really out for a good one. You're out for a good dinner. 
Um, I don't know. Do I, do I still feel like I need to feel like an adult? <laughs> I mean, at well, this Dave, point, I would hope not, but you know, for so many years when you're younger, it's like, Oh, you can have a, you can have a drink. Oh, your parents, you can have a Shirley temple or something. And now I need to show that I'm an adult. Um, I don't know, but it seems to me you could reduce your host, your, uh, not your hospital bill, maybe your hospital bill, your, but your dinner bill by, by almost half. No, if you, if you knock alcohol out of your dinner bill, that's a great way to save, uh, you know, two people going out and two drinks. And let's say that's going to be 10 bucks a pop. That's 40 bucks right there. Right. At the minimum. Right. right. And that, uh, you know, that way you can cut back. You can, heck, if you're going out for Mexican food, you, you cut the bill back by two thirds, especially if you're drinking good tequila, because, uh, you know, Mexican food is a really good value. And it seems like in proportion to the alcohol side of the bill, uh, the food is, is much less, you know? Well, I think I have actually have a really good tip because as you guys know, I used to be a server Uh and where I worked, we, uh, we charged a a corkage fee. And so maybe if you plan on having white, uh, sorry, wine, either white or red, Mm -hmm. then you can, uh, call ahead, see if they have a corkage fee, like 10 or $15 and you save money that way and bring it on in. Sure. Sure. Mm -hmm. You know, another thing that occurred to me, what about the appetizer? They go, Oh, would you like to have an appetizer? Usually an appetizer is kind of a greasy little situation. The, the Funyun onion or the, you know, the calamari or whatever. Sometimes I enjoy an appetizer, but that adds. Um, the dessert adds. Now, the dessert's kind of, you know, that's sacrosanct to me. I, I, I like a good sugar, uh, you know, a good sugary dessert. But, uh, you know, some of the other things, maybe it's, uh, maybe it's an opportunity, you know. What about the delivery end of it? Delivery is a big thing right now. I mean, everybody's having stuff delivered to the, to the front of the house. Uh, but that's got to increase the price of the food, doesn't it? Well, yeah, there's a lot of places that say free delivery. Mm-hmm. And then their online prices are 4 to $5 higher than their in-store prices. Right. So there's no free, free delivery. You're paying for it either way. But that's now part of the math, at least for right now. For some people, it's just safer to have it delivered in carefully remove it um you know from the packaging right just going out to pick it up well when the pet you know when you bring it in you, you put it on the floor in the kitchen you spray it with bleach it's so appetizing <laughs> when you think about that right but i think that we're going to have delivery for quite some time and um the delivery people were getting a piece of uh you know of the of the bill and sometimes you know 30 percent. so la wanted to pass a, an ordinance the city of la that the, the delivery fee from the provider of the food couldn't be more than 15%. I don't know if that's good or bad. That just depends upon your view of the role of government. But, um, you know, they want to cut that back, especially in this time. And I think I talked uh, time last, last time or the time before about a friend of mine who was making like $40 an hour delivering groceries, not made food, but groceries, making a pretty good living. So I don't know. I don't think we can avoid it. But maybe if we think about it and have a plan, we can minimize it a little bit. What do you think, Brian? I think uh, we need to minimize it. You know, and this is just one way um, to try and save a couple of bucks. We've talked about both appetizers. We've talked about alcohol. We've talked about uh, delivery. And yeah, that's something that I think we can all look at in terms of our own budgets and decide maybe there's a way to uh, to shave some you know, exactly. Dollars off this. Exactly. exactly. What are you thinking about some, uh, some other things too? What about uh, phone upgrades? According to Mr. Adcock, I love technology. Oh my God. I like, I mean, I love all the latest stuff. I remember when I first got a razor phone, that little thin aluminum anodized silver, then black thing. And you'd pull it out and people go, Oh, wow. That's really, nice. I dig it. But, uh, I don't know. I mean, I stood in line for four hours to get my first iPhone. And when I got to the front of the line, I said, I'll take two. So I'm, I'm really a fan of that. But I try to not get a new phone every year. I try to go two years, three years, maybe sometimes four, you know. I think the original iPhone was $199 plus a contract. So it seemed like you were getting an almost $1,000 piece of equipment for $199. Of course, you had to commit to a contract that was $35 a month for two years, but 
And I think that was one of the, the ways that the iPhone was so successful besides being an incredible product. But um, now, you, you know, you pay seven, 800, 1100, and they'll spread it out over two, three years, no interest. Someone's saying no interest in payments. That always concerns me. But I think people are getting caught into this and they're missing out on what I call the gravy years. Remember when we were talking about cars, we said, after you pay off the car, but while it still works, there's a period of time. And those are the gravy years when you can bank some of that money. So maybe if you can hang on to your phone a little better, don't uh, you know, let it fall into the water. You could maybe save what six hundred a year for two, three years before you got to get a new. Well, phone. What's the average plan at nowadays? You know, uh, obviously there's you know different packages for family of four, a single person. Mm-hmm. I gotta now, tell you, I can't now really... prepaid. Now prepaid. Everyone now has prepaid, and they're literally going forty bucks a month. Really, is prepaid the new thing? Prepaid is is where it's going towards. You have you can update whenever you want. If you need an extra little extra this month, you can buy it at any time. But it's forty bucks, not one hundred and twenty. So they want forty bucks from, and you've got some flexibility on when you get a, a new phone yeah. or what plan you. No, you're and that's what you know. It's the like my phone is a couple of years old. It's paid off, and I'm on prepaid. That's okay, forty five nice. bucks. That's it. That's really That's good. Really I know. I know at T-Mobile that they have a fifty dollar everything included, unlimited text, unlimited phone, unlimited internet, yeah, and you know well, maybe may, maybe it's just my contract, but I, I thought that was a really good deal. Yeah, and just for our listeners, Nick uh, uh, Nick didn't say T-Mobile because they didn't pay for that. If they want no, to get a mention, they, they didn't pay. So so yeah, <laughs> you said B B Bobble or something like that. Right? <laughs> But, you know, I, I try and buy something that's, you know, a little bit of quality. I, I check prices on the internet, um, you know, but I, but I try and hang out. I try and take care of it, put it in the case and, and do those kinds of things. Cause yeah, I'd like to save some, some money in the long term and not uh, be paying what is it, Brian, the, the 40 a month for whatever and have the latest phone, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, that's a great gig. Yeah. Yeah. Um, number three, clothing and apparel. That's what he said, clothing and apparel. I think it's the same thing. But, um, you know, a, a 2019 GoBankingRates.com report said that the average American spends $1,800 a month on clothing and apparel. I don't know. It seems like a lot to me. Now, I've got some stuff from 25 years ago. Um, I've got way more stuff than I can ever wear. It's not like I'm a clothes horse, but I got old T-shirts and old pair of pants. And, you know, I got a, I got a very large selection of stuff that I truly believe I'll be able to fit into again one day. Well, Dave, everyone yeah. has that, Dave. Everyone yeah. has that. <laughs> right? Yeah. You keep it around. You go, yeah, I'll be able to, two weeks from now. Sure. If I, if I only eat uh, water and cardboard, I'll fit into that. Um, but I think we got a whole bunch of stuff and I, I threw out a whole bunch of stuff on a recent move and I still got way too much stuff. So I don't know my advice buy long lasting quality and check the prices on the internet and shop for the sport of it. And, and when you wear them out, then replace them. But don't don't have like way too much stuff. Any thoughts, guys? Well, from a psychological perspective, which yeah. is completely different than you know a financial. financial yeah. I think it's very healthy to get rid of clothes because, I mean, realistically, if you look at your wardrobe mm-hmm. on a daily, ba- weekly basis, mm-hmm. we pr- we pretty much wear the same things, right? And, you know, in addition, um, I like to donate my clothes and just give mm-hmm. it to a good cause. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it kind of makes you feel good. And it's like you do a little spring cleaning, you know, two times a year. And uh, I, I think it's really good for you. But, you know, like going back to how much people spend on clothes, do we really need it? Do we need to spend that much money? Just something to ponder. No, oh, I agree with you, Brian. Look, two words, tax write off. Two words. I like that. You know, you donate your clothes, you get a write off. It's yep. a little something. It all helps. Yep. Plus, the clothes goes go to a good cause. And you know, Nick, I agree with you. It's there are some things that need to be held on to in life. Other things, you just got to let them go and just not become a pack rat of either physical things or emotional things. Just let it go. Purge it all out. So I'm a firm believer. Yeah, get rid of the clothes. 
donate them in. Uh, yeah, I don't know how much you need to be spending on clothes. It just depends on your industry a little bit, but just don't have your clothes be your uh, barometer for your self worth. No. no, I I agree a hundred percent. And you know, I always thought that that t shirts were kind of a cheesy thing to buy on a vacation. And I found that that's one of the best values. I mean, I still wear a t-shirt from Jamaica and it just says Jamaica on it, but it's, it's probably 10 years, 20 bucks. The you know? $20 shirt that was highly overpriced because they paid a dollar for it, yeah. but it's given you 20 years of happy memories. Yeah. So. And every time I put it on, you know, I, you know, I think yum yeah, on, it's great. Hey, how about number four lottery tickets? Nearly half of all Americans play state lotteries. And according to a 2019 report from Bankrate, consumers spend an average of $86 a month on lottery tickets. This makes no sense to me, guys. I mean, the chances of winning at the lottery are like getting hit by lightning. And yeah, I've, I've played a couple of lottery tickets, like two or three. And of course, I didn't win. But it just seems to me it's a, it's a way to just extract money out of the public by promising them something that's that's so unlikely i mean you could save like a thousand dollars a year by not doing this i don't know what do you guys think well dave as i hold up a 20 dollar scratcher right here oh. that i did not win <laughs> you didn't win lesson learned. i did not win uh let's just say that with experience i wish i put the money in an investment account yeah and with the stock market doing so well for the majority I think uh, you have a better shot of making money on stocks than you do of winning the lottery, which is a one out of a hundred million, you know, percentage to win. So you're equating investments to lottery. Are you saying that uh, investing is gambling? I would say that some people consider it gambling. Right. Um, it depends on your definition. Quite the lawyerly response. <laughs> Mr. Brian, what do you think? I think we can argue that this could be recreation and not investment and not gamble. Look, so you would have some fun with it. Here's what I've always wondered about this is who goes to buy a lottery ticket 20 minutes before the clock closes and you can't buy tickets anymore. So you buy your ticket and you're like, okay, I have a ticket. And then 20 minutes later, you find out I got nothing. If you're going to do it, do it $1 a week and do it as soon as you can buy your ticket, buy the ticket. So you have it for two and a half days of $1. Going. So you got that whole buzz for a couple of days. Yes. Like, what would I do with this recre gabillion? Recreation. It could be considered recreation. Entertainment. It's, it's entertainment. Yeah, there you go. Okay. For the next, you know, two and a half days, I have a ticket that may be worth $50 million. That's, that's great. But buy the ticket two and a half days beforehand, whenever it's, you know, first available. And then that $1 is now providing you entertainment. So yes, Nick, I know you're going to disagree, buddy. You're going to go take those 52 singles, throw them into some stock and see what happens. But I'm saying it's not always about return on investment. This is an entertainment budget. So your entertainment budget you don't go out one night for dinner and you can have your $1 a week um, for super lottery and you'll have that. Nick, what do you think about that, man? Entertainment? I think it is entertainment. I think it gives you that, that rush or that fix, um, you know, leading the days leading up to the draw day, but I'm still a proponent of stocks. And I think one major difference is, let's just say you invest, not invest, you spend $1 a day on lottery tickets, $1 per week, excuse me. And after one year, it's $52. You invest that in a stock. Stocks are very unlikely to go to zero. So you're still going to maintain at least some value after that first year. And then it starts compounding. True. I'm sorry. I fell asleep there, buddy. What? <laughs> oh my god oh my god is, like is, this my, is my new nickname new nickname the professor i apologize where, where come on dude allow allow the people to have one dollar of fun a week 
put the rest of it in the stocks. I agree. But a buck a week, come on. Just do it. Go for it. Whatever. Go go for it. All right. Let's move on. Let's move on, guys. Um, number five, extended warranties. I mean, this seems pretty obvious to me. Is, do we need to talk about it too much? I mean, everything's going to break. Electronics are going to wear out. But more often than not, what you spend, you're not going to get back on, a, on an extended warranty. Agreed? Agreed. Yeah. Okay. That's easy. Number six, cable TV. We've talked about that. We've devoted shows to it. YouTube TV right now is probably the best deal out there. You need a good uh, set of uh, cable channels and you need internet access, maybe a Netflix or a something, and, and you're good to go. But the, the traditional cable package, I think, is, is dead and is going to go the way of the, the dodo bird, you know? Um, number seven, impulse purchases. Well, I mean, that's, that's kind of obvious, too. Um, you know, you, they, they put the, 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 the racy magazines and the chocolate chip cookies and the candy bars by the checkout for a reason. They want you to buy that stuff on the way. You go, yeah, yeah. Unless it's a $1 lottery ticket once a week. For <laughs> there he goes Brian, again. Brian's like a dog with a bone. He won't let that go. Huh? Won't let that go. Oh, my goodness. But, you know, it seems to me there's a couple of things that were maybe left out of this list. You guys have any thoughts? I'm very curious to see what those things that you're thinking of are, Dave. Well, I was thinking, uh, I'm glad you mentioned that, Brian. I was thinking transportation. I mean, that's the second largest expenditure for everybody. And there's always opportunities to, to cut back on total transportation costs. You know, I, mem I remember, I remember going down to a Laker game, and we took the, uh, you know, the subway and the bus and stuff. And my my son bitched and moaned, but I said, look, you know, it costs us like a dollar to get down here and a dollar to get back, and this is perfectly good transportation. It's a, it's a little rough after the game getting from Staples to the the subway station, but other than that, it's it's a pretty good deal. So, um, because it's such a large portion of most people's. Uh, monthly spend plan. I think it's um, something to think about. Certainly something to think about. And you know, going back to, uh, uh, you know, um, Amanda's comments, our millennial that we interviewed, one of the reasons that she was so viable is she had no car payment. So um, I don't know. I, I think that's something that, um, you know, could have been discussed. Of course, it's always up to somebody's perspective or their point of view. But how about gifts? Gifts add up. You look at, you know, you, you know, uh, you know, and uh, someone has a new kid, you give them gifts, people get married, you give them a gift. I'm not saying don't give people gifts. I'm just saying add it up. You might be surprised how much it adds up. How about, uh, how about haircuts? What do you think? I think a lot of people spend a lot of money on haircuts. Yeah. Uh, I, I know I get my haircut every four to six weeks. Yeah. Well, it's been like three months now and my hair is so long. What did, what did you pay for your last haircut? I pay, it's 30 bucks just for the cut and I give a $5 tip. So 35 bucks. Wow. And let's just say you pay, you know, like you go once a month. That's going to be like over 350 bucks. That's a lot of coin. It you is. Just, and just spend $29 on a Floby. You know what that is? It's like a razor built into a vacuum and you hook it to the <laughs> vacuum cleaner and it sucks the hair off your head and cuts it a, like a uniform. Don't you remember that from TV? Hey, the Floby. Don't you remember the Floby, man? The Floby was like a, a razor that was attached to a, the a vacuum, like your vacuum cleaner, and it would like pull the hair off your head and and cut it all to one uniform length. That was a big deal, like 29. Hey, I think you should get one, buddy, and you should use it. Yeah, well, you know. And if you're recorded, for charity. For, we have a video uh, <laughs> feed today, and uh, Brian's wearing a hat, so he's feeling pretty bold talking about my hair today. <laughs> I mean, maybe uh, we could even put it on the website. Hey, I think we ought to do that. People want to see these uh, haircuts. I don't know about you guys, but I had a heck of a time during uh, uh, the, the social D getting the, getting the haircut. It was brutal to find a place to get it done. Still haven't uh, found my place yet. Oh, man. I don't want to, uh, you know, I don't want to admit to anything, but uh, I might have paid cash in an alley, you know. <clears throat> Illegal haircut, David. It was bad. It was bad. It needed to be done. What about uh, anyone else that got any more ideas about where you can cut some uh, corners? The only thing I would add is that there's a, like Dave, you once mentioned it in a, I don't know, one of our podcasts. Yeah. 
there was a guy that you knew that had kind of a distinct vehicle and he kind of that was his trademark he was the yeah. guy he was the attorney who had the funky old classic car that you know technically was a piece of bleep but you know it was his thing yep and i think that's the same thing millennials do where they go i don't have a tv i don't have cable i don't have a car so that's also a way to save money if you're gonna you know take a position that you are against too much television or against too much vehicle you know you can reduce your costs and say it's part of your personality right it's part it's part of your eccentricity it's it's your thing yeah and if you can sell that well i'll sell it i think a lot of millennials aren't doing cable at all cable tv at all no it's all gone they're you know netflix see you know youtube whatever yep i take it from my parents uh no i you uh, don't want to admit that on the. Want to uh, admit that on? Uh, uh, no, I, it's okay because when you purchase cable, you're able to have up to four users. So everything I'm doing is kosher. Okay. Users within the same household. I I may or may not live with my parents. There you go. Tell it. Tell it to the judge someday, man. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. I think that's enough for today. You know, let's let's wrap up and summarize a little bit. You you know, I think. Look for ways to save and, and cut spending if you can. Um, create a smaller nut, going back to the nut concept, which is your your expenses in any particular month. It was a big deal for Amanda when we interviewed her. I look at big items and look at small items because they all add up. Um, you know, a lower nut makes you more viable in tough times and in good times allows you to save more money. And a lot of these things that we talked about you really won't miss it if you think about what Amanda said. She said, well, I'm not going out as much, you know, and I'm not really missing spending all of that money. So a lot of these things that you're doing, if you're just aware of it, you're not going to miss it all that much. And you will have more money for your emergency fund, for your long-term savings, for your retirement, maybe to augment some other things that you, you want to do with your money. Um, so there's a real opportunity there. And it's just a matter of being awake and, and thoughtful and, and conscious about it. Being purposeful, being purposeful with your monthly spending plan. So that's what we have for this week. We're not going to do any emails because we spent an awful lot of time talking about restaurants and uh, and Nick's investments. So um, <laughs> till next time, this is Dave Hagen. This is Brian Reed. This is Nick Appel. And you've been listening to the Financial Wellness Podcast. You've been listening to the Financial Wellness Podcast, Dave's weekly message to keep you on your path to financial success. If you have a question that you would like Dave to answer on the podcast, go to thefinancialwellnesspodcast.com. You can leave an audio message with one click of a button or type your message into the question box. Either way, it's sent right to Dave's phone. Remember, Dave will randomly draw from the submitted questions and pick the winner of a free one hour personal conversation with Dave to help you achieve your financial goals. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast so you receive the new episode notifications or share the podcast via the app with your family and friends. This is your announcer, Nick Appel, wishing you every financial success.